It's the early 1930s, and in the Soviet Union, communism is in full swing, with the main man with the moustache at the helm, overseeing the industrialisation of the country, with one of its important epicentres being the nation's capital Moscow, except the city was experiencing a bit of a transport problem. As this was communist times, and private cars on the road were practically non-existent, the main form of transport for workers in Moscow was trams, consisting of 94% of all traffic. However, as you may know, Moscow isn't renowned for its nice weather all year round, and the tram network would be battered by snow in the winter, which doesn't make for the most efficient and pleasant commute. Something had to change. The big cheese at the top would call for a weatherproof transport system, which could transport the workers to their jobs without completely freezing their Fabergé eggs off on the way there. This was when the idea for the Moscow Metro was born. As this was the first metro system to be built in the Soviet Union, knowledge and experience about designing such a system within the nation was very much lacking. The result of this led to the Soviets calling upon its old capitalist pal Britain to help a comrade out by providing engineering expertise, which they had bags off constructing the tube in London. As with any job which requires tunnelling through miles of soil, the ground conditions would have a profound impact on shaping the metro, and this was certainly the case for Moscow. The presence of old rivers beneath Moscow had meant the ground conditions were less than ideal. Where London had nice clay and New York had reliable bedrock, Moscow had runny sand, which, if possible, Uncle Joe would have sent it with a one-way ticket to the Gulag. The result of these ground conditions, coupled with Moscow's topography, meant construction for the metro would be a combination of deep and shallow tunnel construction. As the topography varies less on the outskirts of the city centre, stations were able to be built shallower using cut and cover, which included both terminuses of the line. As the line moves towards the city centre, the topography varies much more, resulting in deeper stations, which were located over 30 metres below ground level. Fueled with knowledge and experience from the British, construction on the first line began in late 1931 and Moscow was on its way to getting a plush new metro system. However, as one can imagine, by allowing foreign engineers to help design your metro system, the Brits got to know the city's physical layout pretty well, which the Soviets loved so much, they arrested some of the engineers for espionage, eventually kicking them out in 1933, ending British business in the USSR. However, this little collaboration between the Soviets and British didn't just extend to Moscow. In fact, the British built their very own Moscow Metro-inspired tube station, Gant Hill, located on the Central Line, which opened in 1946. The first line opened on the 15th of May 1935, starting at Park Kotorovi in the southwest of the city, through the centre and past Red Square, up to Saloniki, northeast of the centre. The line opened to a fanfare of celebrations, large crowds, and some good old capitalism fashion. One thing the Soviets did have over the capitalists was the elegance and grandeur of the interiors of the stations, and this was no means a coincidence. It was thought that the architecture of the stations in capitalist countries was dull and gloomy, which in turn would make a tired worker feel even more tired when they hopped on the metro. Moscow was to do a complete 180 on this, and build stations with interiors so grand they would be able to lift even the most starving and freezing workers' spirits. The stations, dubbed People's Palaces, would be kitted out with chandeliers, mosaics, statues and enough marble to completely cover Red Square ten times over. The grandeur of the stations went into overdrive during the Stalin era with his socialist realism, with the opulence peaking for the stations constructed in the early 1950s and are the standout stations when people look at the architecture of the Moscow Metro. After Stalin kicked the bucket came Nikita Khrushchev, who had no time for Stalin's OTT splendour, toning down the lavishness of the stations during his time at the top. However, even after both Stalin and Khrushchev's stints in charge, Moscow Metro station design has continued to evolve, designing stations that are both unique and architecturally stunning, becoming must-visit attractions in Moscow in their own right. Ever since the first line opened in 1935, the system has grown from strength to strength, expanding to over 230 stations over 11 lines, becoming the busiest system in Europe, carrying over 2.5 billion passengers a year. It goes to show, the communist government, and a little help from the British, 
you can build a transport system which will make the catalyst green with envy. 